As AI agents become more advanced, their deployment raises new considerations beyond those of traditional machine learning systems. In this episode, we examine whether deploying AI agents truly differs from conventional approaches and explore the key steps involved in bringing them into production. We also discuss strategies for maintaining stability and reliability once these systems are live, addressing both technical and ethical challenges. Finally, we consider how our discussions around AI deployment shift as models continue to improve. Let's invite our next guest, Aaron Bermiesh, Principal Architect at EGEN. Aaron, it's great to have you back on the show. It's great to be back. How does deploying AI agents into production differ from doing the same with traditional ML systems? Whether it's a chatbot, whether it's a conversational agent, both text or voice-based, whether it's a large language model doing some agentic workflow across some PDF document. The set of actions that one would want to take in order to productionalize such a system is the same as you would for a machine learning system. I think what has happened is because a lot of the machine learning aspects, the model training, the model deployments has been abstracted away uh, and now all you have to do is make a API call to your preferred cloud vendor to get a text response back. A lot of people now approach this uh, from the perspective of it is now just an engineering problem. But under the hood, trying not to use these technologies as a black box, it is still a machine learning model. It is an autoregressive transformer. You still have these statistics and the non-determinism that come with any machine learning um, system that you have to put into production. So the muscles that have been built up to productionalize a recommendation system, to productionalize a binary classifier, and these muscles can still be used for your preferred Gen AI solution. You just have to do some tweaking to get it right. Can you also talk about what steps are involved in deploying an agentic system into production? Let's take it as three steps. The first step is your traditional machine learning setup, where you need to go to your subject matter experts, to your data set, and build out a curated baseline and evaluation set. What this allows you to do is to build out then a train and test split, a section of the data that you can go and use to build your solution on, and then another section of the data which allows you to do evaluations on that you were initially blind to. What this lets you do is to determine whether or not your Gen AI chatbot, your conversational agent, et cetera, generalizes in production at the level of accuracy that you are seeing in your testing suite. In addition to building out your baselines, you could also have considerations around the concept of a AI red team, where instead of a machine learning system, which might only give you a zero or a one, a chatbot now have conversations with you. And so you want to make sure that your um, Gen AI solution is not producing harmful content, content that you don't want to be affiliated with from a brand perspective, from a legal perspective. There are also industry-specific uh, concerns. Say you're an airline, and as an airline, you've put out a conversational agent where users can go and have conversations with it and talk about what flights they could buy and at what prices. It would be quite unfortunate for the business if someone were to come along and be able to purchase a flight to Finland for $10. Those are kind of the additional uh, avenues that we have to make sure that we protect against. Are they happening at a one out of 100 rate, one out of 1,000 rate, one out of 10 million rate? Uh, and then quantify that you know, to the impact of the business to determine whether or not additional time needs to be invested into it. The third and final aspect, which I greatly advise to any business doing machine learning in production, is the A-B test, where you put up your new solution, machine learning, Gen AI, et cetera, to the old way of doing things. And before doing it, determine what are the business KPIs that we're hoping to lift in using this new technology. Every ML system needs to be updated in the event that model or data drift occurs. This isn't software you, where you can set it and forget it. This is machine learning. You set it and you continue to monitor it. That requires continual investment. We can 
make an argument for that continual investment by showing in the A-B test that we lift up your business KPIs, even if it's just profitability, whether it be click-through rate, et cetera, uh, we can show that this solution does better than the old method. So of course, we wanna keep it into production. I think if an uh, enterprise goes through those three steps, they'll find their Gen AI applications will be much more successful. Can you also talk about what kind of teams get involved when we are talking about deploying AI agents? Because you know, from old days versus new days, a lot of silos was broken, but you know, new personas have also evolved. So where does the buck stop? You will always still have your front-end development teams building out the user experience uh, that users can interact with. You still have the core application teams building out the software application and that core functionality. And you still have your machine learning teams, but the machine learning teams now have a additional set of skill sets. It's no longer do I do stochastic gradient descent using uh, an XGBoost model or a neural network. It can sometimes be, do I just do prompt engineering uh, in order to drive up these KPIs because that's what gets us the highest business value in the shortest time frame. I think that one of the things that we see in industry a lot of is has the ML role, the machine learning scientist role, transition to purely prompt engineering. And I think that prompt engineering is a skill set in a bucket. You wouldn't hire ML scientists just to do the prompt engineering. What you're hiring them to do is that when you do the baseline evaluations, when you do the A-B tests, that these things are done in a statistically robust way so that you can trust the outcomes. It would be quite unfortunate if you thought that you had a 95% accuracy on this baseline. You put it into production. It didn't generalize because you were overfit on your train set. And turns out you were only getting 60%. So now your business over the course of that A-B test lost $20 million. That's why you really hire the ML scientists. It's not just the prompt engineering piece now. While every business wants to get on AI, Gen AI bandwagon, how should they evaluate it so they get the most value out of their investment? I think when going into building out that initial use case, what a lot of enterprises do is they say, Gen AI is the hot new thing. We need to have it. We need to have this. And so they go online, they say, what's a Gen AI application? 99% of people are saying it's a chat bot, talk to your document type use case. I think that's a hammer looking for a nail uh, scenario. What I think the value is for a lot of the Gen AI applications is instead of enabling users to chat with uh, internal documentations, what aspects of the business can be completely transformed with Gen AI? These large language models specifically focus on natural language processing. They're very good at text. What part of the business consumes a lot of text? Most businesses have document-heavy business processes, which are highly standardized. You train an army of people to do it. And what this allows you to do is to say, well, what is that workflow? that's being done there. For that workflow, what are the questions that my people are asking in that workflow that can then be answered by a large language model? What this now unlocks, especially if you are very careful about that use case, because you don't want just a use case where you say, I'm reducing my cost. The really special ones are the ones where you can come in and say, my business, has a bottleneck based on headcount. If we could remove that bottleneck, then we could do much more of that business. Revenue scales much better than you know cost reduction. It is these use cases, these document heavy business process use cases where the business has 20, 30% of their headcount doing it. They're bottlenecked uh, based on headcount so you can unlock more revenue. And then from there, all you have to do is get started build out your baseline, pick your preferred large language model, and start scaling this out into production. And earlier, as we were talking about, you shared some steps, three steps you talk about in you know, deploying agenting systems. Uh, when you work with uh, customers, what are the mistakes that you or missteps that you see companies often make, then they should avoid? 
I think a lot of companies um, are doing right now is they approach it from a engineering perspective, which I'm not saying engineering is not important. It actually makes up about 70% of all of our AI engagements. But at the back end, and this could just be my background as a scientist showing, uh, but on the back end, it's still all about the statistics. Um, do you have enough, say, documents to conclusively say that the accuracy that you're going to be getting is what you're going to see in production? That's a statistical test. Uh, and I, we can go out and pick the statistical test most relevant uh, to the problem that you're trying to solve. For the A-B test, have we ran that A-B test long enough in production to be certain that we're actually getting that value? The number of A-B tests I've seen where you go into it thinking two, three weeks and we'll have collected enough data, business leaders get one or two days into it, go, we're getting great results, let's send this full speed into production. And I, as a scientist, have to sit there and go, well, we're really nowhere close to saying this is conclusive, this could just be random noise. Um, the skill sets required to do Gen AI are different. You don't need to know how to do the fancy ML training so much anymore. You can do a lot of it with prompt engineering. But I think for rapid prototyping, prompt engineering is the right way of going about doing it. But when you start thinking about what does a automated setup, especially for those document heavy use cases we were just talking about, what do they look like? Well, then you're going to start getting into more of the sophisticated machine learning. Can we drop the latencies? Can we do this at lower costs? Uh, can I provide confidence scores at high accuracies as well so you know what can be automated and what can't be automated? All of these then bring in that traditional machine learning skill set. Now, you and I have spoken in past a lot about, you know, AI. Can you talk about how have the discussions around uh, AI have evolved because uh, models are becoming more advanced, technologies are also changing. I don't want to even talk about deep seek. So much is happening in this space. So how have the discussions evolved over time? I think uh, for this part, I would want to socialize the framework of an AI lifecycle. What does productionalizing AI use cases look like? As we talked about before, there is the business use case development. How do I take the pie in the sky idea, pull it down to earth and make it executable on for a machine learning team to start work? There's the data part where you go in and I have to work with subject matter experts to find the data and label the data. There's the use case, the actual solving of the use case, the prompt engineering, the model training. There's the productionalization, typically on some Gen AI platform. And then there is the monitoring, all of the statistics that we've talked about. This is kind of a very general AI life cycle. As models get better, what part of the AI life cycle has the changes made to it? It's only the third one. It makes developing the use cases easier. The amount of prompt engineering I need to put into it uh, decreases, thankfully. Um, I can do many more use cases than I could a year or two ago. So that pathway to production is becoming faster on the ML side. But 70% of your development time will go into the software side. It'll be the data pipeline. It'll be the cloud infrastructure. It'll be the orchestration platform for document ingestion and API calls to the model. This doesn't change as models get better. What I think a lot of businesses can invest in is building these out right now for use cases that they know have value to their business. Because maybe right now you get 90% on that use case. And that could be good enough for a co-pilot AI assistant to your business stakeholders. But as the models get better, you already have built the platform and all of the infrastructure that you need in order to be successful. You can now slot in new models and immediately get that um, accuracy increase. If you do it the other way, however, if you wait as a business for the GPT-5, the Gemini 3, 4, then decide to go out and find the use cases and build the use cases, you're still sitting with six months to a year to build out all of the infrastructure needed to support it. 
And that's even before we go out and say, do we have the guardrail metrics that we need? Do we have the risk modeling that we need? Do we have the AI governance? Everything that comes in that monitoring side of the AI life cycle. So as models get better, it is easier to do use cases, faster to do use cases, and you can do more complex ones. But the core work where most of your time is going to be invested in doesn't change. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me today and talk about AI agents deployment, the challenges and the right way to approach them. Thanks for great insights. And I look forward to chat with you again. Thank you. I'm always happy to come back. Thank you.